Hi there, Nick Vince here. Today on the Chattering Hour, I'm joined by Jen and Sylvia Suska and the star of their third original film, On the Edge, Aramis Sartorio. We talk about that, their early lives and influences, and what Aramis had to go through to prepare for this. Up next on the Chattering Hour, Jen and Sylvia Suska and Aramis Sartorio. And we're back with Jen and Sylvia Soska and Aramis Sartorio. I watched the world premiere of On the Edge at Fright Fest in London back in August and was, frankly, blown away. It is an extraordinarily difficult watch because it deals with such torturous things, but has a heart so deeply embedded in it and really speaks about the human condition and is completely... Amazing as far as I'm concerned. So, enough of me waffling and raving about it. Let's get talking with these fine folks. So you may need to tap your screen just to agree. Just so got, it. Yeah. got it. Got it. Got it. Found got it. I consent. I consent. I consent. <laughs> <laughs> about consent um oh my god that would be such a fun commercial to do with all the the stars of adult you know arima that like just teaching civilians how to do it i consent i still yeah. consent like those, those plans have changed i still consent and then like who is those, it is uh, jason that doesn't like sex yeah jason, and jason really just there he's like, like i don't <laughs> <laughs> Like those commercials for the new meds where it's just like, I consent. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting topic because I remember that somebody did a very good um, video about, is it the equivalent of offering somebody a cup of tea? Ooh. If they say no, you don't give them the cup of tea. Okay. It's very yeah, simple. It's very it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. <laughs> yes. I love that. I think I've actually seen that furthermore as a meme where they're trying to force the tea down someone's throat and they're like, you wouldn't do this to a guest in your house. Why is <laughs> there's, there's a in any other situation? I, 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 that's a thing that, oh, that's a thing a lot of people don't realize, like in adult work, like we have a conversation before we do everything. So whenever a girl who does sometimes is like, why is she doing again? And she's like, what's wrong with her? And it's like, she gets to pick and choose. What's wrong? With her? <laughs> it's come on. It's a she orders off the menu before the food shows up, you guys. Yeah, it's just... spoiler alert. I knew drinks were coming from the table. I felt like them for today. Not every day. Sometimes I don't. I like to eat sometimes. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, um I had some questions in here before we start. Ah! Oh no. Oh, Nicholas, <laughs> thank you for having us. You were at the world premiere of On the Edge. God bless you. That was thrilling. Well, thank you very much indeed for agreeing to come on, all three of you. And yes, we will talk about On the Edge later, but I'm going to actually take all three of you right back. I am going to take you back to the very beginning where I start with all my guests on this show. And that is, where were you born? Oh, wow. Wow. I was born in North Vancouver at Lionsgate Hospital. On the fourth floor at uh, 458, 458, 517 AM. That's why we're up in getters. But when she turned 18 for... 19 minutes she said I was a child and she came in and laughed at me for oh. but when you turn 65 don't you wait oh who's the senior now huh is this older <laughs> abuse? Is this older god, abuse? god punishes me because pe some people don't know we're twins and they're like oh you must be the older sister and I'm like the hell you just said to me <laughs> 19 minutes of youth I know 
<laughs> Nervous? Why are you laughing? That's so funny. I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I read, I'm not. Just remembering a joke. You just saw a funny meme pop up. Yeah. It's not you. <laughs> I did you, that. Uh, I I was because my uh dad came from Cuba, so as far as I know, <laughs> I don't get a lot of history about my childhood, which is kind of weird, and his side of the family, but. Uh, I was born in Miami, but I was only there for like a little bit. And I just remember New York and everything. So I don't, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not proud of Florida and Miami. So I just kind of say I'm from New York. Just leave it at that. <laughs> it's, it's fascinating because I, I, the girls know I'm working on a, a project at the moment and it involves looking at my family history i have films of myself <laughs> literally the few day a week a couple of weeks i say it is two weeks at least after i was born because in those days they let my mother stay in hospital for two whole weeks after i was born wow. because the attitude then was is this is a very tiring exhausting program process yeah. for the yeah. last nine months <laughs> You think? Perhaps you, could do, <laughs> yeah, perhaps you could do with a rest. We'll look after you for a couple of weeks. Wow, know. haven't we changed? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> also, you just had a baby. It probably needs help. Yeah. yeah. Now now it's, it comes up. <laughs> it's yeah. like I get two weeks off from work for birth. <laughs> like, see you back in two weeks, right? Yeah, <laughs> well, they you out the hospital Gosh, the next man. day. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it was incredible. Anyway, okay, so uh, we'll stick with Aramis for a moment then. So what was a typical day like for you as a kid? What sort of things did you get up to? So as a child, I always had a very uh, big imagination. Uh I, I had a lot of friends, but they were more like sports friends, kind of like let's play baseball, football, handball, sickball, uh, freeze tag, you know, <laughs> all the all that stuff. But when I was alone, I just um, I, I loved uh, posing my toys in certain positions and I would spend hours doing it just to like have this like huge fight sequence and everything and it just like it really consumed me and i'm obviously watching movies and just we had two couches uh and i'm sure my fuck the neighbors underneath me fucking hated me but i would jump from one couch to the other and i'm sure i'd like slid and made their fucking shielding <laughs> shake and they're like i hate this fucking kid but it was just you know that was like my imagination like wanting to do like stunt work and just be an actor and i have two kids now and one thing i do with my youngest we play fight and we'll play fight for like an hour or whatever <laughs> And it's just like what sometimes in stores or whatever, we'll just start doing this. And it's like, I, I, I like, I love that. I love that he insists to do that and everything, but yeah, just kind of letting my mind go. And I, I wish, uh, I don't know. I had a little more friends that were more in that same grounded, like imagination instead of like, just like, yeah, hey, let's go throw a ball around. And, you know, <laughs> but, like, you know, and I still I still kind of kept that. And I guess like definitely having kids kind of kept me to not let that like little ma imagination go, that little Jeffrey, I don't want to grow up on a Toys R Us kid. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on to that for as long as I can. Because <laughs> the world is scary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What about you, uh, Jen and Sylvia? Well, I had... I had her. Yeah. And I would say it was kind of like an Adams family upbringing in the way that my mom is very cool. My dad is also very, cool. very cool. He's a very accomplished artist. He's a painter uh, and my mom's a photographer and my dad's also a musician. But my mom loved Stephen King and she loved horror movies. And my dad being religious was concerned 
as a good parent is yes. that maybe the darkness and the devil would get us through the horror movies. Oh. But my mom was very much like, it's just a horror movie. It's just a book. And when we were still in elementary school, we had convinced my mom to read Stephen King novels. So we were reading at like an advanced level. We were drawing a lot. We were watching horror movies. We were playing with bugs. We're Canadian, so we we're outside a lot as well. Yeah. Yeah, we played with a lot of bugs. Like I think yeah. we were always going to be directors looking back at it. Because like even when we were playing Batman, I would be like, okay, so I'm going to be Batman. You're Catwoman. I'm sorry, you have to be a robber this time, but afterwards you can be Batman. I want to be Batman. There can't be two there Batmans. Be two Batmans. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm, I'm the director, okay? So I'm also the Batman. So just FYI. <laughs> but it's it's funny because like I'm so used to always having another person there. A question we always get is, what is it like being a twin? I'm like, I have no idea what it's like not being a twin. I always yeah. have a best friend. And a lot of the time we've learned not to cut each other off because we'll think about the exact same thing in like a hive mind way. And I'm like, okay, so we don't start talking at the same time. Let's just say the one story. Yeah. Talking is of course, one of our favorite things to do, but we were called kind of weird. I mean, we had friends. We were weird. Okay. We were weird. We, were weird. <laughs> yeah. we didn't have as many. I mean, pe- everything that people like us for now and be like, Whoa, you love wrestling and comic books and video games and like art. And I'm like, and, that, horror, yeah. and horror, horror and none of that, none of that was cool as a child. No, it was weird. <laughs> yeah. We always, but I, I always remember we were kind of like a little spectacle because like uh, people didn't have cell phone cameras, mm-hmm. but they would have like wind up cameras and they would always stop my mom and be like, can I get a photo of your daughters, a photo with your daughters? And we didn't get it. But she would always be like, be polite, because most people don't know what twins are. And we were like, we didn't understand. We're like, yeah. they must be from out of town. OK, here you go. Because yeah. <laughs> we are twins. We experienced it all the time. And I remember we it was we were around the age of the Olsen twins yeah. when it became officially OK to treat twins like shit. Yeah, <laughs> people were so curious. And then it became like uh, the countdown for when they were bangable. So I think that but was. But there's no other visual mind <laughs> that can go over to and be like, you're one of them. Yeah. <gasps> yeah. And take like a picture <laughs> and reach out and like touch us and be like. I heard I heard you. people like you can read thoughts. It's a true. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> if, if I hit her, will you feel it? And our, of course, the answer is like, no, but you'll feel it. Yeah, but when security <laughs> guards ask us that at the airport, and then we're just like, I don't know, sir. Can I go to the country I'm going to? Like- the amount of times an official has sang the double mint commercial to me, and I'm just like, yes, I understand. It's a sexual innuendo. You're very clever. I get it. Yeah, it's a little ahead of my time, but you know what? Because I'm a twin, I get the reference. I get the reference. I do. Gum and identical twins is fun. <laughs> <laughs> wow, so- taking the pictures. That's weird. It yeah. was, right? And now people are like, why are you so good when people like you're eating a meal or you're like having a mental breakdown and someone touches you for a photo and you're just like, yeah, <laughs> you, just, you become used to it. And you're like, nobody cares if I'm having a low moment. They're just going to be like, oh, she's a bitch. But I'm going to be like, whatever. I just put that death aside for the moment. They'll still be dead after the photo. I've seen <laughs> more famous people get it. Like some people that you can't go to lunch with and sit in front of a window because their fans will go there and knock and be like, you're in a bar. My kid's underage. Can you come outside for the audit? And they do it. And I'm like, God, the life you live for right now. And then they'll post the photo, but like, this guy was an asshole. I'm like, ah! I made my two minutes like 20 minutes like finished his beer piece of shit. Anyway, I dig food to eat. It's fat. Yeah. <laughs> Just a normal childhood. Yeah. Yeah. Normal. <laughs> yeah. And what about you, Aramis? What sort of TV and films were you watching? I mean, uh, definitely. So I, I was born in 76. So I had you know gi joe transformers he-man sesame street the muppets yeah. uh charlie brown you know uh holiday specials uh i just i i am you know uh benny hill was a huge part of my life i yeah my see at a young age in new york it was kind of like if we're watching tv we're watching it all together so if it's PG or rated R, you're seeing like, <laughs> and it was just kind of like, it became normal, like to see like, you know, 
you know, my mommy, like, cover your eyes. It was like. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, what are you going to do? Like, are you serious? Um, but yeah, just, you know, I think TV and sitcoms were like getting big. Like, you know, the Jeffersons were like crazy. And I grew up in a very like mixed neighborhood of Italians, Greeks, Indian you know, and it's, it was crazy growing up. Like when I see now how my kids are and people are like, Hey, that's not cool. You shouldn't say that. Where before it was just like, everybody was just <laughs> racist. <laughs> but it was just like, <gasps> you wouldn't say, you'd say the, sto- the story you're going to, you say their, their race, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it's just, but like in just TV back then was, I don't know, whatever, whatever is great. Like Indiana Jones, like the first I saw in the, I remember so, and only because they repeated it, like seeing Indiana Jones in the theater with my parents was like, holy shit, you know? And, but like when a new movie came on, you know, this on channel seven, the special or Friday night videos, you know, it's just, I don't know. It was so different then. Um, but like The Shining scared the shit out of me. We watched that as a kid and I didn't watch it till I, like, I would literally cover my eyes till I was in my 20s. The old lady in the tub scared the shit out of me. <laughs> once I finally watched it, I was like, this is amazing. Like, it, I fell in love with the movie because it was beautiful. And I was like, what the fuck was I scared about? The Exorcist was another one. Uh, when we finally got cable and we had Cinemax, Skinemax, I think, that's, <laughs> I think that's where I was just overload of, you know, Tropic Thunder or whatever all those Andy, Andy Sedaris. No, those like action, slight erotica movies. I don't know. I had a huge plethora of entertainment. Right. <laughs> and it all... <laughs> Yeah, it all like fucked at me in the right, wrong way. It was, I don't know, it was <laughs> so much. As a kid, whatever was on, uh, my dad went to sleep early because he, uh, he drove a cab. So like a lot of times it was like, I'm going to stay up till I fall asleep watching TV. And nobody was there to be like, go to bed. Sometimes they would. I was the youngest of a brother and two sisters. But I don't know, it's just... I watched a lot of TV and whatever was on. So. <laughs> right. And so w- did you guys, did you train at all for acting? I always wanted to be an actor. Uh, definitely just, again, like watching TV, like the fa- for stunt work, like the fall guy was my favorite show. Lee majors was just like, I, I was like, wow, I really want to do this. And I did get to have a little stunt training in Seattle with uh, at the U- uh, U.S. Stunt School of America. And that was like fulfilling a dream and everything. So that was cool. But uh, honestly, the only real training I had, I would say, was I met a few guys in high school and we started a sketch comedy troupe. And we did that for like 11 years. And it was you know, uh, we would put our tapes up on public access. So it was just like before YouTube and everything. And it was just like, it was fucking, I don't know. Like it was, we did ridiculous, stupid shit that has not aged well. <laughs> and, we, and it was just like, oh, this is funny. And it's like, wow, that was not funny. But I don't know. We That was like my experience of doing that. And then from that doing like, I was in bands and I did martial arts and just uh, it was always wanting to do that, but never really taking the chance to do it. And then, you know, trying to act in some things with friends and auditioning, like I auditioned for Primal Fear and sat next to Edward Norton, you know, and I was like, and then he became that and you know and eventually you like blessed him I, I, yeah he, he asked me what does he smell like <laughs> i his resume was huge yeah i yeah. i glanced over and i was just like this fucking guy 
it was just like already like holy shit um but really i always held down like a regular job and acting and all the other things i always wanted to do like were kind of like a side thing like maybe one day or who knows but it wasn't until i got into adult where it's just like steady acting kind of all became a part of life and it was like being i did the um the comedy stuff the sketch comedy uh when i got into adult everyone was like whoa you're so trained and you know how to deliver a line and stay in character <laughs> and you're funny and so and then honestly like adult has probably prepared me to do everything i've done from then on and like definitely for on the edge it like it was so weird that I've done thousands of scenes and you see everything, but it was like on the edge for some reason. I was so nervous and it was just like, there's so many more eyes going to be on me. And I was so like, why is this freaking me out? Like I've done horrendous insane <laughs> in front of hundreds of people, like insane. But like this was like keeping me up at night nerve-wracking like it was because it meant so much and everything but um yeah just com comedy kind of got me into doing something and then it was kind of adult like just made it all more possible and everything okay so, so um, i'm going to ask the same question of jen and sylvia and i'm going to come back to you Anna Romas. so where did you where did you train Jennifer and I, oh my gosh. So after a ballerina accident when I was seven, we uh, decided a dramatic career shift. <laughs> and at this time, the Olsen twins were popular and they had an acting class and they said, you want to take that? And we're like, yes. <laughs> well, now everyone imagines us, us as young, like Suspiria twins. Yeah. Well, well <laughs> And I actually thought uh, being successful in the film industry was a lot quicker. I, I am 39 now, so it's been it's been a slow, slow burn. Uh, <laughs> after those rec center courses, I think we went to uh, somebody who ripped off my parents hundreds of dollars guaranteeing us a career. And uh, I mean, we learned a little bit from there. Uh, at one point, uh, our acting resume was only um, slutty this, sexy that. <laughs> my dad's never sexually empowered no, though no. it was just kind of like where was hmm. my story why did i become so slutty we have to figure anyway what was i fighting against why how was my <laughs> sluttiness save the world anyway my my dad love i love him so much so conservative put up with so much stuff he looked at our resume and our our, our uh gpa, GPA which is uh, we were honor roll students he's like I'm holding these up and they don't make sense. Why? And he's like, this here. And then he started reading the credits. And we're like, okay, dad, we're going to be more serious about this. We're going to, instead of being, uh, being in typical twin roles, we're going to be stunt actresses. So instead of uh, us being in a bikini only, I'm going to punch a girl and then be set on fire in a bikini. It'll be, <laughs> sick. It'll be the same thing. And we had a, an agent that was like, these girls are stupid. This is awesome. And they had a, 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 a film school that was upstairs that they got a 10% hit of our, our tuition. We made sure we put all the money in and we're like, there we go. Now we're going to be famous. And this is like uh, our 20s. And we were so, um, it was a 2000, early 2000s. Yeah, okay. 2001. Yeah. During the writer's strike, actually. 2001 was a rough year. Anyways, uh, we, it was, it was just a really good scam for dumb people that had too much money. And I remember it was like a cold read course and people were being taught how to read in front of, which is a, which is a valiant effort, but not mm -hmm. for, and I, I remember, uh grindhouse was in the theaters at the time and every day we would we would go and see that robert rodriguez quentin tarantino jason eisner eli roth all those other uh edgar wright uh collaboration we'd be like man i wish we were doing this and we would because we watched all of his 10 minute film schools growing up we watched all these commentaries we read all these books we we're like how how are we going to be able to do this and then um they took the funding for our last project and said just merge with another group and it was 200 bucks from our like thousands of dollars of tuition uh. so uh we walked out at the theater and this one and jen 
out of the two of us, Jen always says the thing that I'm like, holy shit, I can't believe you said that. It's, it's also usually the most marketable thing, though. Yeah. And mm-hmm. she goes, dead hooker in a trunk. And I'm like, what's that? And I said, I don't know. But at one point, we'll probably have to put a, a dead hooker in the trunk. <laughs> to not piss up our audiences. But at the time, we had uh, the Picton farmer. Yeah. Who is a prolific serial killer who targeted sex workers. So uh, the joke in Dead Hooker in a Trunk, because people are like, you don't care about sex workers. Well, Aramis, you can tell us them we love sex workers. That's a different story. Uh, our joke with Dead Hooker in a Trunk is you had to be a beautiful, blonde, Caucasian woman for anyone to give a crap about you know whether she's missing or not yeah and it's the poor the only people that care the only moralistic thing in it is trying to put her to rest and everything Mm -hmm. slapstick except at one point we had them we we had the coordinator from the last samurai do the hooker beat down no wonder her death scene yeah Uh, epic yeah and you know it was weird because making a film became our first film school like we made a fake trailer for the film school as a fuck you to them they had a list of everything that was too inappropriate but they forgot necrophilia and bestiality we're like fuck these guys like seriously fuck and (laughs) i don't know why we were like that but that's the fire um, and the passion of a filmmaker. I know Lars von Trier many times have gone, fuck these guys. I think I felt that way before we made On the Edge, too, because I was like, fuck this. I want to make something fucking crazy. Anyway, so we made that movie. Half the audience walked out. The other half was cheering so loud you couldn't hear the intentionally disgusting uh, dialogue. So we played it twice. They asked us, uh, when is the feature? We lied. Said we're working on it right now. We're in pre-production, actually, and you're at a preview screening. Always lie if you can pull it off. Figure out a way to pull it off. And uh, yeah, history. Yeah, we were also trained in martial arts for this stunt stuff. But the oh, funny yeah. thing is, in high school, we both wanted to be actresses because yeah. they, tell oh. you, they don't tell you be a producer, be a director, be a studio head, and then just shove yourself into the movie. And I remember we they, we took every acting course that was possible and there's only directing courses left. And we we're like, oh, as long as I can be in the theater, fine. Yeah. And <laughs> it was finally grade 12 graduation. And like, I was such a kiss ass theater student. I was like, I'm like, I have to be the best everything. And then the awards were coming up. We we're like, oh, here it comes best actress, best actress. We're the first ever students to win best director together. And I remember being like, what? What? I want this. I don't want this. I'm an actress. Yeah. <laughs> to the universe, we might have been. We might have been a it little more like, ahead. Oh, yeah, do like, this instead. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that was that was the training we had. But you know, a lot of um, piss and vinegar and fuck it, I'm gonna do it anyways. Attitude. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Nice. So. The question that I really need to ask Aram is, um, how did you get into the adult film industry? Oh, uh, I, <laughs> so the first, uh, <laughs> the first like adult magazine I ever picked up had, was a Playboy with Jessica Hahn. And it was like in a gutter or something. I was like, oh, what's the... Oh my god! It's just that <laughs> thing went snap, and I was like, "Yeah, I get it. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is cool." <laughs> and I, I don't know. I just like I loved. I don't know. I like, you know, buying movies and porn, and and I would have so much. I would just hand them out. I was like, I got no storage, friends. So <laughs> here you go. And then when I got a computer, it's just like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Down the pee hole. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I came across <laughs> I came across Burning Angel because they just started. And I was messaging, I think, Joanna Angel on MySpace. Wow. Or Friendster, one of them. Uh, and a friend of mine, Doug Sackman, who works with, uh, I met through trauma, uh, Lloyd Kaufman and everything. And it was just like coincidence. Like he's his group of friends. Uh, they were always like trying to like do something more than just make movies. So they 
one of their guys, it was like in their crew, they had like a few like geniuses in a way. It was really weird, but you know, but they were all like drunks and everything. But uh, so he invented a vodka filter to churn, uh, it was, I think, called a gray kangaroo and it churned shitty vodka into good vodka. And yeah, I know, right? <laughs> it was like a little filter thing they did. And but so Joanna and Doug kind of connected and he was like, we'll throw parties and supply girls if you supply the vodka. And that's how they met. And then I knew Doug and I was like, wow, I always wondered, can I do this? Like, and then Doug eventually introduced me to Joanna and Burning Angel, like Suicide Squad, uh, Suicide Squad, <laughs> Suicide Girls. Uh, they were out at the time and they were too similar because they really only did, uh, Suicide Girls only did like photos and I don't think videos, but photos mostly. And Joanna, Burning Angel was like the same kind of all punk, you know, tattooed everything. And they're like, how do we do different? And then it was like, well, the only way we're going to separate us from them is we got to go adult and do like full on porn. So she, um, they were happening, they were making their first movie and burningangel.com, the movie. And like, she had access because uh, one of their, uh, her partner, he was in like a few pretty big, like uh, hardcore bands. So they had access to a lot of like bands like kill switch engage and um brah, so many <laughs> so the movie was going to be scenes and then her interviewing these bands so when the thing came up that they i like i put out there i want to do it doug introduced us she gave me an interview um so your interview was in a bar. She's like, do you have any barbed wire tattoo? I was like, no. She's like, fine. I couldn't use you if you did. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. And then I was the third choice out of two guys. That, uh, Three times lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the whole story is like, we were going to finally shoot. And she kept, she's like, all right, if I shoot with you, you can't have hair on your body. And I was like, all right. So for a month, I was shaving my hair all along. And she kept, she kept fucking canceling. And I was going nuts because I was like, this is driving me crazy. Like, so we go to this one place and it was really weird the whole day. Like I sat at a park. I got there early. I was calling friends. I was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. This is crazy. And like the groups of old lady I was sitting next to on the, on the bench, we haven't said one word to each other. But when I get up to go, they're like, hey, good luck. And I was just like, what? <laughs> I was like, was I talking loud? I didn't, I don't know why, but they said that. I was like, okay. So we go to this fucking themed hotel in Manhattan, which I had no idea about. And all the plumbing is fucked up in the place. And they're like, oh, we got to cancel again. I was like, look, <laughs> I can't keep shaving my body. Like I did maintenance work. I'm up and downstairs, friction all day. I was like, I'm going crazy. <laughs> and I, I was like, let me call my friend. I was in a band at the time and he had a loft. So he's like, oh, let's, um, can I use your loft? He's like, I'm not at work. My roommate's there. Sure. So we uh -huh. go there. They're like, there's graffiti on the rooftop. Do you want to check out up there? They're like, oh, we love it up there. Let's do the photos. And I was like, oh, we're going to do the scene in the, the room. They're like, hey, do you want to do the scene on the roof? And I was like, fuck it. Fine. Yeah, whatever. Okay. As long as it gets done. Oh, oh my God. So we're on the roof and there was two people up, two or three people. And we're like, look, we're going to shoot something here. We can't actually leave. You live here. But if you just keep it down, they're like, yeah, we'll keep it down. Tick <laughs> texting. As we're shooting the scene, we just, they had these, they were so like uh, unprepared or not professional. So they had these Costco like work lights 
that were just blinding us because it's like they didn't have like lights. So while we're shooting the scene, and it was an <laughs> thing, her, her first scene, my first scene, while we're shooting it, the, the fire door keeps opening. We're hearing it, but we can't see anything because the light's shining on us. So, so we finally finish and there's like 30 people watching us. So everybody in the building just was texting somebody, they're shooting porn on the roof, come upstairs. So when we finish, we get this round of applause. <laughs> and my friend was finally came home from work and he's there with his roommates and they're all drinking beer. And there's just like fucking everybody's just like, Woo! and it was like that was my first scene and then wow. from then on it was just crazy like my third scene was the repenetrator Whoa. The, the reanimator that was my first the third scene and then like we wanted to do horror themes because that one did well then we did the triple exorcist yeah yeah Sorry. where we actually it drove out to Washington uh I did a a very slow stair fall down those steps. <laughs> we were going to shoot in front of the house, but the rain fucked up. It was pouring rain. So we didn't get there in time. And the, who lived that there now said uh, they put up like a, like a boards and not boards, like a big fence in front of the house. Cause people kept standing on their lawn, taking pictures. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so, but he had an arrangement, but we got there late, so we didn't do it. But we still went to the stairs and everything. And I never been to DC, so I was like, "This is just a great adventure and everything." So that was the start of it. Wow. And yeah, and eighteen June, like next year will be nineteen years later. I'm still st still here. <laughs> still here. You're still here. But you, it's interesting because you mentioned earlier on how intimidating you found doing on the edge why what was it that was concerning you most about you know it? yeah it, it's like it's so weird because it's like all the 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 smut the the disgusting dirty all the places i've been like i've traveled so much i've had sex and public and train stations in berlin like just insanity so much stuff and it was the, what made what, what how i see it is like all that stuff i did gave me the courage to do on the edge because i've never been in something where i was so like vulnerable so weak and so depressed and like seeing and like that being on camera and everything and it was just like needing to know where I had to go to get to that point and be in that that space and like being like naked and like all this stuff even though you know you don't fully like you see my butt and everything it was just I I don't think I could have done what I did if I didn't have those years of like kind of rinsing off shame and not like I don't have shame anymore <laughs> but it was just because of all that but like doing this it gave me so much courage to do all that and that's what um like the payoff was I was just like I don't think I could have done this if I didn't have the courage from doing all that other stuff because like we read when I read the script and you even told me like when we were talking about it in July, when we first started chatting, it was just so, it was like very demeaning, very humiliating. Like just to be in that perspective is like not something a lot of men, you know, want to be perceived that or seen or anything. And it was just, it was, it was very, um, as hard as it was to get there, like it was very, like, refreshing to do that to like get to that point and kind of let all that out and kind of just cry and be there so it was just it, it's so weird because you know that when they're uh i think 
Sylvia, you were saying like when your agents read the script, they're like, good luck finding someone to do this. And they were like, well, we fucking did. We <laughs> well, did it done. <laughs> yeah, it's <was> done. <laughs> so it was just, yeah, it was, I like, yeah, it just had a doing that and just being there in that headspace. Like, I think adult prepared me to do that. So it's, right. that's how I, I, I see it and everything it was just, and then when it was coming out and to be there and it's just knowing that so many more people are going to see it in that way and not see me and not this like when i first read it like i was like oh like you like i don't see peter as like macho or brave or anything and like that's how men just want to be perceived and stuff but you know i i i think um getting to be somebody weak and so like caring and like I didn't when I first read it, I didn't see that. But like the more I started reading in Peter, and I was like, this is such a powerful, great role for this, for me to like to do that, and just to also portray somebody like that with everything that I do have in the background, and just kind of really uh, everybody see me as someone different, more human, and more like you know loving, and you know compassion of like he does love his family and you know it's just like I never had that chance to really do something like that and like just really say it and like every time I like read it and rehearsing it you know I was saying like I'm sure my neighbors were like what the fuck is wrong with this guy it's like 4 a.m he's crying again he's saying the same thing again what is happening you know it's it was amazing. Like it really was a life changing experience experience for me. So thank you. Oh, Aramis, <laughs> like, we couldn't have done it with. I feel bad saying we wrote it for you, but no, I didn't think anybody else could pull it off. It was like to me, it was like a, a kink version of Passion of the Christ because everybody feels like those two things are separate, and it's Catholic guilt that makes somebody like Peter suffer in the way that he doesn't on the edge and I don't want to spoil anything for anybody but when you watch that movie a second time you're like fuck now I get it I get it and there's so much I mean people think everybody what you said it the other day people punch each other till someone shouts watermelon and that's BDSM yeah. and that's that is not it at all <laughs> that's <laughs> ridiculous it's, yeah. right it's not it's just it's, abusive it's yeah. just abuse yeah. it's, that's not what it is it, I mean I think unless we talk about BDSM and we wanted to show like not everybody is going to have a 36 hour session like Peter, but we wanted to people to see what it would look like without the, the negative connotations of what they think it's going to look like. And Aramis, you, you play Peter so well, everybody loves you. Everybody. And I've had, I had guys who didn't, they thought it was going to be a fun, sexy movie after Fright Fest. And they're like in tears first embarrassed. They sit that sat through the movie, then embarrassed that they liked the movie. Then they didn't know how they could tell me that they related to you. And then they just giggled for a bunch of times. And I was like, that's, the best review I could get. Yeah. There was a few guys who came up to me and it was just like a little intimidating, muscular guy. And he was just like, so that was that was good. That was it. <laughs> you know, right? like, I was like, oh my God. I was like, yeah, that's where you know it, it's just it's it's really it was really something to just let go and to say like some those some of those monologues like were so amazing like really the script was so awesome and there was one review uh i read and the guy was like yeah fuck this guy fuck peter like he deserved it and then like the end thing was just like i felt like shit <laughs> i felt really shitty for judging him yeah. and for you know like wanting this guy to be like tormented and destroyed and then it was like oh wow I feel actually bad about like why did I do that <laughs> like, that makes so. me so happy to hear because I I'm, people that I know that work in adult and sex workers I see them as sex therapists I even see adult as sex therapy it's like regular therapy you can be doing it the right way or you can just be wasting your time while you're doing it you know, and so many people look at sex work or adults through the lens of their own sexual um, I don't trauma. Want, 
trauma is the right word, their own sexual trauma, or even worse, the trauma someone else has had and they've given them. So now they see it through this skewed thing. I wanted mm. the movie to be an adult, a, a dominatrix session for someone who will probably never go. Yeah, I mean, and also the people who go all the time and they'll watch the film and be like, thank you. I'm not a pervert. I'm doing it in a little thing all off to my, and it's because of this other reason. Like you really can't judge people and the way that he battles with his Catholic guilt. I love God. I have a lot of problems with a lot of religions because they all preach love and none of them, every one of them has a little asterisk next to it. It's not like God, you know, comes in annually and puts on his God glasses because he's getting old now too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, he's, like yeah. he's like you know what we're gonna have to change this changed my mind about female priests yeah definitely let's re- let's make all altar servers adults yeah until yeah. we <laughs> figure out the issue you know <laughs> yeah. just just things like that so i really wanted people because i know some people have had abuse and trauma mm-hmm. and they think they even have had like people who are Christian say, oh, it's because God hates you or you're punished because of that. Yeah. And it disgusts me because a loving God or a loving Christian person would say it's not you or there's nothing wrong with you. A bad thing happened to you. And the fucked up thing is it might not even have come from a bad person. They just might have had a bunch of bad things happen to them, too. And now they can only make bad choices. And they're yeah. good from it. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I haven't done which suddenly occurred to me is actually just ask um either any of you just to give a quick introduction to the film um for those of you because obviously it's just going around festivals at the moment oh that's right and and i haven't actually just put it into a little bit of the context as to what this film is about of course mistress would you oh yes i would the film is about family man Peter, played by the wonderful Aramis Sartorio, who books a 36-hour session with a dominatrix who just might end up being the devil. Because she is much more in te- in, uh, set on making him suffer for his sins, and she knows things about him that nobody should normally know about him. Um, when we were banned from the South African Film Festival by censors, they said uh, that we would be morally damaging for children if they ever saw the film. I agree. I agree. Uh, I didn't make it for age. children. It's a I horror agree. festival. No. They That's said we promoted, we promoted ritualistic sex and it was guilty. Ambiguous to whether Peter ever enjoyed it or not. Oh, and they really <laughs> had a huge issue with psychedelics being used for medicinal purposes and actually for curing depression, anxiety, and PTSD. I live in Canada. We're a little bit ahead of the curve. We we listen to all that stuff that we poo-pooed in the 70s and we're like, uh-oh, it does help with depression. Uh-oh, it does help with yeah. this. They, they <laughs> said South Africa didn't like blasphemy and they were right. Uh, I th- uh, I argue because <laughs> it's not at the throughout the film people people see blasphemy yeah. but what I see is Peter's faith protecting him. Me too. Yeah. It's, when even the snake part, which is what most people are like, but that's bad. I'm like, that symbolizes the incident that happened and the the crucifix is that his God has gotten him through here. Yeah. There. He's with him still. So God's still there and the snake doesn't really have anything. It's and like it's- a Rorschach print though. Like anyone can watch it and be like, you hate this. And I'm like, no, but it sounds like maybe you do. Yeah. Yeah. That's everyone likes to blame for something else. But it's yeah. like, what about Other- you? <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, yeah, it's just a fun family story about a guy who's working stuff out and goes, it, it's kind of like uh, <laughs> the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, but instead of going to a magical land in the closet, you go to the penthouse and you work some shit out. Yeah. And I got a lot of like, I brought my mom and I'm like, ah, did you hear me advertise this film? I said, even if you don't like it and you walk out, I understand. I understand. You might need to come back and watch it in 12 years and be like, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> 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 what um what do your parents think of it Jen and Sylvia it's funny because they read the script and they really they really liked it and I remember at one point my I don't know what they think of the the film film because we haven't spoken about it but I remember 
my because they wa- were supposedly to watch it around uh, uh fright fest time but my my dad turned to me after reading the script he's like you like to do movies like this, don't you? And I was like, yeah. And then he laughed. He was like, oh, Sushi. <laughs> and I, was like, uh, I thought my mom, because I uh, I want to, I am a certified sex worker right now. I am a dominator. Very important for me to have done that. And I, I, of course, wear a lot or not very much in the film. And I wear this beautiful agent provocateur underwear, which is like more expensive than most of the real clothes I own. Mom, <laughs> it perfect. Mom said, I looked so, she said how you're so brave yeah. and I was like it's so nice to have parents that are supportive of like I mean we're, we really try them we really oh, oh god, really. my god they are so loving and forgive I remember I didn't and accepting. like I remember American Mary I was like my parents are going to disown me and now them reading especially the and the mother script is way oh. more graphic than the movie so the fact that my dad read that he's probably like you know what I googled I'm good I hope, you guys, I hope you guys did good oh it's even gotten to the point with vendetta they're like how come you and, and nicely they're like how come you didn't put a sexual assault in this one i'm like ah they're always surprised they're like you guys <laughs> tried <laughs> and we were told no and it wasn't because the actors weren't willing to do it we had an argument they're like well it has to be like shawshank redemption and like, and, and like great and they're like there wasn't a sexual assault in shawshank redemption I'm like did you watch the tv edit the because... studio gas <laughs> i was like what I don't know. It's like Jedi mind trick. And I was like, you know what? I'll just leave this one. <laughs> I, I I have to say, Aramis, I, I think I can't remember if I did have a chance to say to you at Fright Fest, I was absolutely blown away by your performance. Uh, um, thank you. But also, again, what I said to Jen and Sylvia was that after I watched American Mary, I said, hold on. But this is a romance. And I wasn't expecting a romance. This is I found this very moving at the end. And again, with this, I thought, you know, you'd hear all those right notes. What where where it when it has managed to screen at festivals, you mentioned um, I think possibly before we started recording, you just won some awards in Milan, I think. Yes, we have. What are the, what how what are the reactions? What have, what's the feedback you've been getting? surprisingly uh after fright fest i got three reviews that used a word that usually doesn't happen in my movies unless the word not is in front of it and they said, <laughs> and, and it usually- oh my god the amount of reviews i've had for especially american mary it's not perfect <laughs> I, I, I will never achieve that senpai i'm sorry i offended I you without perfection but they love they loved it and the thing was even people who hadn't normally watched it, like I really liked the uh, review from Dread Central because I met the, I met, I believe I met the gentleman after the Fright Fest screening. And I don't think that this was a movie that people normally would watch. And I think that's the cool thing about On the Edges. Everyone's like, oh, it's going to be one of those campy, culty, Sasuke sister movies where I'm going to be laughing the whole time. And you're like, aha, he spilled breakfast in the beginning. And then you're like, oh. And it, I remember at one point there was like a silent awe and people were like, whoa, what's that? And I was like, oh, I, I think we've horrified them. I think we finally did it. Like That's what the, the silent thing is. But they love it. And uh, even talking about it's interesting to see the religious aspect for it. Uh, most people don't expect Peter to have the uh, catharsis that he does because everybody is like, oh, I know the Saskia sisters. Oh, here we go. We're going to beat the shit out of someone. And then the thing was uh we found that it was more interesting to talk about something maybe you don't see and maybe when you assume something it's not the way it's not going to turn out the way that you assumed it to be um i have so many friends that have been kink shamed and a lot of the time it happens they have a a breakup and then it's like oh he did this or she did that and i'm like oh but you guys agreed to it at the time it shouldn't be in the press right now and it to me it seems like such a nice opportunity for people to watch this and be like oh I didn't know aftercare was a part of a BDSM session. Well, maybe we could do this and then you could pet my hair and tell me I look pretty for 20 minutes after. And they're like, yeah, we can do that. Be like, whoa, that's a thing we can do. And it doesn't have to be like as crazy. The movie is like the threshold. Like if you can do that, good. That's, that's, I mean, like one person even said the movie wasn't hardcore enough for them. And I was like, I don't know what else to do. They said it was so beautifully shot and they expected it to be graphic. And I was like, 
all of our movies are you're like oh someone's clitor- clitoris is cut off but it looks beautiful like that's I thought that was kind of our style <laughs> um, the civilians have a mixed bag of reactions mostly women are so and gay guys they love it yeah I mean putting stuff in well I don't want to do any spoilers but there there's things that we do to you Aramis that the female and gay audience are like oh that's, that's I love it us. it's the civilians either more. Either, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, and women also go big or go power. home. <laughs> There's so many movies where it's the gender reversal, yeah. and it's a guy who's yeah. in the powerful mm-hmm. sexual position. So women are really like super, like whoa, I didn't even know. But there are some men that are like, I don't like it, and I'm like, if you watch the entire thing of it, and if in a, like in a regular S and M session, if you say red or if you say watermelon or whatever it is, it ends. Yeah, it ends. It's not like somebody's going to come in and beat you until you're like nearly unconscious, and then they're like, "Good sex." And then, <laughs> and then they just leave. That was a whole huge part of like uh, on the edge too. That why we didn't want any like wounds or anything left because we didn't want to encourage bad like sex play. But I also have such a nice reaction from sex workers and mostly former dominatrixes. There's one former dominatrix who sat next to me during the fright fest thing. Every time everyone was very, very quiet. And I learned later it was terrified respect. Yeah. Which I have a couple of director friends that do terrified respect movies. And they're like, oh, yeah, I always wonder if they hate it, too, because they're always so quiet. And then afterwards they thank me, but they look scared still. Yeah. But they, she had such a good time. She laughed through the entire time. And she said, it makes me think about my former work in a totally new light. And I kind of miss it. Yeah. Yeah. And no matter what happens, like people, whether they've liked the movie or not gotten it, adored it, you two have gotten the highest rating out of everything. People love it. They're like, why is it only 36 hours? (laughs) I know. We'll do a TV series. They'll torture him different every day if you wish. Yes. Uh, wait, what's next for On the Edge? You got more festivals? Have you got distribution lined up yet? Uh, we have it set up with distributors. We ha- we haven't uh, had any announcements yet about who's going where, but we uh, are going to be playing Milan February 10th. We won for Best Sound Design, Best Runner-Up for Best Feature and Best Script. It's okay. I'll take it. Uh, um, December 9th, we are playing four more cities in Australia as part of Monster Fest, which is Adelaide, Perth, Sydney, Brisbane. and Brisbane. Wow. Right. <laughs> and uh we have three American West Coast, East Coast, Central. Uh oh, and then there's a Los Angeles one that we are waiting to hear back from. Uh one of them is uh, an Oscar qualifying one because we decided to go and to try and get to a foreign film. Who knows? Who knows? Terrifier two inspired us. We're like, maybe we're the black horse where they're like, we really like demon sex. We have surprisingly <laughs> enough a green band trailer coming for on the edge. You know how hard it was? We did a wow. teaser that like it was like just a piece, but people people were like, I can't even watch this piece. And I'm like, oh, yeah. okay. So it's it's more mellow if you can be mellow with what we do in the film. Yeah, it's an art house trailer with all the nice reviews. And stuff. Yeah, some people are going to be tricked into learning a lot about sex, but it's good for you. It's very good for you. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we're going to continue touring with it. I believe it is going to be released. I really, you know, I don't it's know where to kill on VOD. That's where I really, I know that it's going to like shudder. I've watched stuff that's basically porn already, you guys. I think it's a nice home for it. But hey, maybe next week's Flix Canada wants to step up. That there, would be crazy. There's a chance. Hey, there's not that many movies coming out next year. Maybe somebody's like, let's give it a cool two week run in theaters and let's see what we can do. Because it play- <laughs> it's really fun to watch with your friends if you can get them to come out and watch it with you. It really divides the room. <laughs> I, I i think in a theater with a like a right the right crowd it would fucking go over amazing like apparently that's happening in australia right now they are really really having a lovely time <laughs> yeah awesome wow. <laughs> wow. what else have you got uh, you guys got planned i'll go back to aramis for the for this one what else have you got coming out aramis I mean, as of now, riding this wave and seeing where On the Edge takes me, um, you know, this was, I like, I did 
in 2011, I did like the gruesome death of Har- Tommy Pistol, like wrote, directed, starred, got it distributed. That was great. And then it was like nothing else happened, you know, and it was just like, all right, so back to, you know, adult work and everything. And I mean, this is like the biggest opportunity I've had. Like, I really, um, this is, I think this is going to do a lot for me. Uh, I think it could open more doors and seeking agent managers, all that stuff. Like, you know, I, I love doing this and, you know, at 46, like I still have a lot of chutzpah in me. <laughs> I want to keep going and, you know, but uh, I also know my adult life has an expiration date, you know, and I'd rather bow out before, you know, <laughs> the door closes or the phone yeah. calls stop coming. But I, I really, I really love acting. I love entertainment. I love performing. I love being in front of the camera, creating, doing stuff. So um, right now, like a lot's on the table it's um we're on the edge go and then just trying to find that next big um gig and everything so i mean i i'm i got new movies coming out every week (laughs) you know honestly but it's not the ones i could promote on facebook and like you know and i'm usually playing you know the stepfather doctor teacher lawyer (laughs) It's to say I'm typecasted, but, you know, but, you know, I, I just, I don't know. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot that's going to happen and I don't know what yet. And that's, that's part of the excitement of seeing what's, what's going to happen. You know, uh, during COVID, me and uh, my partner, Nicole McClure, we wrote a TV pilot and we're kind of showing that to people and we got actual notes from like an agent and it was just like, oh, that's a step further to something that we might do. And it, like, it's just, I don't know. There's a lot going on and uh, we'll see what happens. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, cool. All right. Sylvia and Jen. Um, well, uh, on the edge kicked off Cathasay Productions, which is a new independent Canadian uh, studio here. Uh, Aramis, you don't even know this. We're working on our five, 10 year plan for the next few feature films. Uh, they're also getting into documentaries, uh, mm-hmm. then, which is really exciting. And also it's nice that they're uh, promoting our Canadian cinematic identity. Cause a lot of uh, places we are, are production companies for the U S a lot of people fly in here. We don't show off our talent. So what Kath is say is going to do is focus on Canadian stories, Canadian talent, and all sorts of Canadian things like that. And, uh, it's been exciting to kick off. And then, in the spring, Jen and I are going to start, start shooting a new movie. Yeah, it's called Unseen. It's going to be with Radar Pictures uh, and with Ted Field, who is like the mastermind behind uh, Interscope Records. And he also made one of my favorite films, What Dreams May Come. Yeah, This is actually my version of What Dreams May Come. But I am the kind of artist that unless I said that in the commentary, nobody would know. And then they'd watch and be like, oh. I absolutely get it. Yeah, and- Sparrow Pictures is coming on Martin Katz and Karen Wilkie. And uh, Film Mode is coming on to, uh, from after making Rabid with us, they're like, these girls are good for horror. So they, they jumped on for this new franchise that we're Yeah, playing. it's a sci-fi thriller. And it's, it's about a Boston couple. One of them is an astrophysicist. And they end up blind waking up one morning. And what's worse is everyone is blind. And there's something else in the darkness with them. Do, do, do. Yeah. One other thing we're doing. We're doing a huge comic book thing that I can't announce, but I can say that it's coming. We're writing something. Yeah. And people will be able to read it soon. And it's awesome. I've said that I said that about three super famous female characters. And then they're like, guess what? We paid you, but we're keeping the story forever. And like, until oh. I get more famous. <laughs> yeah, there's a great Wonder Woman story that DC has just Shh. been sitting on. I bet it's it. So good. It comes out next Halloween. They're like, we have this. They might. <laughs> They Hell might. Yeah. They were sending it out, and then they saw on the edge. They're like, "Nope, still no. Nope, still no. Still no." <laughs> Print it. No, wait, wait, wait. Bring it back. It's like when we have CW interviews, and they're like, "We can't hire the uh, directors of American Mary," and I'm like, "Why not?" And they're like, "What if they watch that movie?" And I'm like, "What if? 
What if? <laughs> it's actually pretty tame if you watch it. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I can m- list like 10 worse movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, that's true but that's yeah, what yeah. <laughs> guys thank you this has been amazing thank you so very much uh, all three of you oh you're thank amazing you. thank you so much nicholas for having us you're a legend and it was an honor to have you at the screening it, yes. it, it, it filled our little artist hearts with joy oh, i will thank you again for agreeing to come on the show and again in case people haven't gathered just how much I love this movie. I found it oh. absolutely entrancing, horrifying, disturbing, enlightening, and revelationary. Um, so, yeah, a, a, a wonderful. If you have the chance to go and see it, it's not going to be for everybody. It is not a family film. <laughs> really clear on that one. <laughs> It got more laughs than I expected. Uncomfortable was... laughs. Yeah. Laughs are buried in there. People really need a laugh. They're like, ah. <laughs> they're like, <laughs> right? I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah, very interesting reaction. But yeah, I think it was the stunned silence at Fright Fest where people were just going, "Oh yeah, they're really, they're really into this now. This is really de- deeply affecting people." If you have a chance, go and see it. Aramis, Jen, Sylvia, thank you very much indeed. My thanks again to Jen and Sylvia and to Aramis Sartorio. That was just absolutely fascinating as far as I was concerned, and I hope you enjoyed it. Join me in a couple of weeks just before Christmas on December 22nd when I'll have another guest from the worlds of horror, thriller and suspense. And in the meantime, stay safe and well.